welcome to the CEC report for the 31st of October 2014. I'm Elisa Barwick and with me today is Robert Barwick. Welcome back. Thanks, Elisa. Now, in today's show, CEC report from Europe, growing support for new just economic order and Australia must declare independence and join AIIB, not TPP. So firstly, CEC report from Europe, growing support for new just economic order. Now, Robert, you were a part of an international conference, the 30th anniversary conference of our affiliate organisation in Europe, the Schiller Institute, yep. which took place on the 18th to 19th October. And this is a part of a series of conferences dedicated to creating a new paradigm for the survival of civilization. Uh, this particular conference was headlined the New Silk Road and China's Lunar Program, Mankind is the Only Creative Species. Now last week we talked about this on the show and we read out a part of the resolution that was passed yep. at that conference unanimously which called upon the great nations to work together to combat the triple threat that the world is currently facing, uh, which is the threat of the Islamic State expansion, the Ebola crisis, and a new global financial crisis worse than 2008. Now, your presentation to this conference was titled, Which Way Australia? To Hell with London and Wall Street or to the Heavens with the Bricks? So maybe you can give our viewers a bit of an idea of exactly what you spoke about, but also who was there and how did they receive what you had to say about Australia's role in this world situation? Well, this was a very important and strategic conference, Elisa, and I think um, the Schiller Institute you know, is becoming a, a, a focus of people around the world who, in, from various nations who actually want to break out of the... The, um, the sometimes a self-imposed but certainly st strategically imposed uh, boundaries that sort of put uh, sometimes make war inevitable. What I mean by that is, you know, um, there was a British philosopher hundreds of years ago named Thomas Hobbes, and Hobbes described the world as a war of each against all, mm. and frankly, British strategy is based on that idea that if you're not at the top of the pile, someone else is, and therefore you've got to be in a, in a permanent combat with that. Mm. And why does the world have to be that way, right? And so what the Schiller Institute has fought for for, th for its 30 years is the idea of a world of perfectly sovereign nation states where peace is based on collaboration around economic development. And now we need that more than ever, right? Mm. So, you know, you've got, and um, you might have mentioned it last week, but we've with uh, even someone like Malcolm Fraser, the former Prime Minister of Australia, sent greetings to this conference um, because what the conference was about is people of his ilk around the world either attending or, or viewing this discussion about how can we uh, stop the, the drive that's coming out of places like London and Wall Street to... Um, preserve their dominance in the world, preserve the Anglo-American dominance in the world a against the rise of countries like China, mm -hmm. right? And that thinking is going to end in a war because a country like China is not going to bow the knee and say, sorry, Your Majesty, we're, mm -hmm. we're going to stop growing. Sorry, Prince Philip, for mm. having 1.4 billion people. Mm. They're not going to do that. Nor Russia. Right? Nor, uh, definitely not Russia. Um, and consequently, they're rallying other major countries to the cause, Brazil, India, um, South Africa, etc., and more around them. So, um, you know, the quality of discussion was not, it's not, this was not a discussion about how do we declare war on Britain and the United States. It was about how do we get the best people in Europe, the best people in America, the best people around the world to trump those vested interests inside those countries who want war so that we can reach out together and collaborate for peace. Um, and you know it was it was very high level from that standpoint. Now I must say I'll, I will we'll talk about my speech, but <laughs> I do have to say send a greeting myself because uh, the Australian viewers of this show should realise the CEC report is actually watched internationally. Yeah. And so when I turned up at the conference, um, I was overwhelmingly greeted by a 
a lady from Switzerland. Her name is Franz Wise. And hello, Franz Wise. I know you're watching. Franz Wise is a regular viewer of the CEC report on mm. YouTube, right? And she just hangs on our every word all, all from all the way over there in Switzerland. And so that was very nice to meet Franz Wise. And um, Franz Wise, my daughter, thanks you for the Swiss chocolates that you gave me to bring back to Australia. I don't know if I have to declare that on the pecuniary <laughs> Too late. Re interest <laughs> register, but anyway, that was, that was very nice. And it just shows you, you know, um, as an organisation, we're an Australian political party, but we are actually having a global impact too. Mm. So my presentation was about, you know, here as Australia, we're really up against a hard choice because economically, if we stick with the strategic alliances we have, London and Wall Street, who are, and I say London and Wall Street, you know, the politicians will think United States and, you know, um, Great Britain, but they are under the control of London and Wall Street. That's who we're sticking with. Mm. We are going down the gurgler fast, right? And you can see that in, say, the financial system inquiry has just announced that whatever discussion they were even having about ring fencing a few months ago, that's now off the agenda. And they're just going to push ahead with a so-called reform that's going to give the banks carte blanche for everything. Um, whereas we have an opportunity in our region, most of the countries in our region, driven by the necessity of having large populations, etc., want to develop. Mm. And Australia yeah. has the choice to do that with them. And we've just had an invitation extended to us from China to join this thing called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, mm. which we'll talk about more in the next segment. We have slapped it down. Mm. Why have we slapped it down? Because America told us to slap mm. it down, right? Mm -hmm. But even before that, Elisa, one of the things I spoke about in my speech was Joe Hockey was claiming he was interested in the idea, but mm. he wanted to influence it in such a way that instead of it, instead of us thinking of this as a multilateral bank, where, which was a straightforward way of investing in infrastructure, Hockey wanted to try and twist it so it became more along the Australian model mm -hmm. of investing in infrastructure, but only through public-private partnerships so that infrastructure is not built for its own sake, mm. but it's built so that certain vested interests can can only build the infrastructure that returns them a massive return financially, such as Macquarie Bank's toll roads. Mm, and right? he proposed this umbrella organisation to be run by the World Bank to yep. s oversee basically the AIIB, the National Deve the New Development Bank of the BRICS and so yep. forth. And it's an, it's a, what it shows you is it's not even... If America, in this case, did overtly pressure us, but it's, but it, it's almost unnecessary. Mm. It's mm. axiomatic in Australia's minds. Mm. We've, we've got this British educated view that cannot break free of the ideology that, mm. that we've, you know, the way we've destroyed our economy, we would like to share that with China, with Asia now, right? Mm. Well, that's probably not going to fly over there, uh, up, up there, thank goodness. But that's the kind of thing I was presenting. Look, Australia has a choice. And the title, or to the heavens, the, what we're pointing out there is these countries want to collaborate with us in Asia, such as China and India. What are they doing? Mm. They're, they're, they're even got a cutting edge parts of their economy, such as space programs, which Australia was a pioneer in, by the way, which mm. we don't have any of that anymore. But they are showing the world what can be done. And by contrast, if you saw the news this week, poor old, poor old NASA, Obama's NASA, which is now based on outsourcing, the private company that launched this rocket, it blew up. Mm. Right? This is NASA, the great, you know, used to be the greatest space agency in the world, and it's reduced to a pathetic mess. Um, whereas China and India are having success after success after success. And we are supposed to view that with suspicion because it's China and India? No, no, no. That's the kind of thinking that has to change, and, and that was the point of this. Um, and there were, you know, I met a very good pers um, uh, economist from India named Jay Sri Sengupta, who was who gave us a very good uh, perspective on what I India's potential is hmm. now under people like Modi, the new president there. Mm. There were people from China representing the highest levels of China at this conference. There were people from Russia. Every were continent. From, every fact, continent was yeah. represented, including us, mm. thanks to me and um, the people I was with being there. And one thing I wanted to also ask about is the progress in Europe for Glass-Steagall because there has been quite a strong push in Italy and in Sweden and in the United Kingdom. In fact, the United Kingdom came very close last year yep. to passing Glass-Steagall in the parliament and you did go via London on your way to Europe. So have you got a bit of an update on how that's travelling over there? Look, there is very strong support for Glass-Steagall in Europe, including in the UK, which we knew before we went. But that had a... They, what, what people might not know is the UK succeeded in, in 
electrifying the ring fence with Glass-Steagall. So hopefully viewers know the ring fence idea, which is you don't make banks split up, but you do make them internally split their retail division from their investment division. Under the same roof. So the supporters of Glass-Steagall could not get Glass-Steagall up, but they did get this provision that if a bank is caught breaching the ring fence, so that if the investment bank cowboys jump over the fence and start raiding the piggy banks of the savings division, right, if they're caught out doing that, then Glass-Steagall, a full Glass-Steagall, will be applied to that bank straight away. Yeah, that yeah. bank will be forced to split up. So that's very good. What's really disappointing, though, is even that ring-fencing law, as bad as it is in the UK, doesn't start until 2019. Hmm. And there's a financial crash just around the corner. Yeah. And that we spoke to people um, who are very well connected in the financial system, and they agree with us. The next financial crash is roaring down on us now. That's driving the whole strategic perspective as well as economic policy. And Glass-Steagall cannot wait until, or even ring fencing cannot wait until 2019. No. Um, and so uh, what we were bringing was a sense that there's an international fight for this and that got people's attention, right? The international scale of this yeah. fight and hopefully that will bear fruit. Mm. So we're going to stop there for a moment, but after the break we'll talk more about this re the reason why Australia rejected the invitation to join the AIIB. Yep. Welcome back to the CC Report. Australia must declare independence and join AIIB, not TPP. So we're talking here about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank versus yep. the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And we put out a media release, which people can go to our website to read yesterday, which was entitled, An Independent Australia Would Join the Asian Infrastructure Bank, Not the TPP Free Trade Death Pact. Now, as way of background, on the 24th of October, Last Friday, 21 nations, including China, met in Beijing to sign a Memorandum of Understanding uh, on establishing this Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And, and Australia it, and was... it should have been 22, but yeah, we weren't there. We were invited to be part of that founding group. We didn't even, we didn't even go to observe it, let alone no. participate in it. No. Um, now, there's been apparently a big fight in the Cabinet and the, of the Government about this. Um, now, Joe Hockey, as we said earlier, has professed to be in favour of it, but even he, uh, when it came down to it, basically said, look, we've got a large number of questions that haven't been uh, formally answered and we want to have more to do with the structure and the setup of this. Um, but apparently the camp of Foreign uh, Affairs Minister Julie Bishop won the day uh, and her reasoning and others' reasoning was for geopolitical reasons, and this is where the US advice to us not to join this came in. Uh, well, well, were the main factor. That's the diplomatic word for yeah. advice. It wasn't advice. It was yeah. an order, right? See what's the, and and the, the reporting. There's there's some accurate reporting. It, like Paul Kelly has an article in the Australian Today, which basically says, look, this was this was a decision taken for strategic reasons. But there's an element of fraud in the whole thing because they're casting it as this de, you know this debate in Canberra. In the, part, in the cabinet weighing up competing interests of Australia. No, no, it was, it was never the case because even before America exerted overt pressure, and they did, and that was, you know, I've spoken to people in the Australian government who, uh, in the, who were in favour of this, they describe it as outrageous. America has really overexerted itself here. They've shown their hand, really, and mm -hmm. people need to see mm. it that way. Um, but like we said before the break, Australia's whole attitude to it was twisted because it was axiomatically saying we only want something that fits in with our free trade, deregulated, privatised, destroyed industrial economy, mm. right? And I'll give you one example. That, um, and Paul Kelly highlights this. They kept saying Australia was putting conditions on us joining and they were financial and governance conditions. And whatever, I'm not sure what the financial ones were, but certainly the governance conditions are... They were, there was concern about the environmental standards <laughs> of the projects that the AIIB would fund. Now, yeah. con so consider this, right? Here's China, which builds infrastructure, being told by us, you've got to meet our environmental standards for building infrastructure, mm. but we're the country 
which doesn't build infrastructure mm -hmm. because of environmental standards. Yeah, and that's right? one of the major reasons too why the World Bank doesn't do anything. Of course. It delays and delays because you've got to have all the studies and so forth. Million studies and the environmental you know, the, concerns. The green fascist apparatus that Prince Philip initially set up in Australia has brought everything like this to a halt. The Snowy Mountain scheme wouldn't even be considered today, let mm. alone let alone built, right? Mm. So China is not going to think like that. And that tell see I when I, you know, when you see, when you know that's true, even before the U.S. pressure, it was very unlikely Australia would genuinely have participated in this. However, um, at least if we had have joined, as we were invited to, and had no good reason not to, at least if we had to join, then over time that might have changed. Mm. And there's, there's still a chance that we can yeah, join. It's... But certainly, I, the other thing I want to say, though, on, on the U.S. pressure, it is really America really has has um, shown its hand here, because. Obama announced that he's going to pivot to Asia. Mm -hmm. And we've warned for three years, Elisa, and people like you know, Malcolm Fraser um, you know, came out with the same warning, that this is an undisguised, or well, they've attempted to disguise it, if you've got your blinkers off, it's an undisguised um, strategic move to contain China, mm -hmm. right? And all the so-called positive stuff is just window dressing. And so here was a case where... Um, Australia could have participated in something, and in, but because it was Chinese-led, mm. the Americans said, "No, we do not want you to do it." And in our press release, we talk about macho, the big macho Tony shirt front Abbott. I'll stand up to Putin, be, mm. beat my chest. I'm a tough guy. Well, Nancy boy John Kerry tells him you shouldn't participate in this. <laughs> Obama calls him up and says you shouldn't participate in this, and uh, uh, Tony okay. Tony Abbott meekly bows and said. Yes, we won't. Yes, sir. Um, now, of course, it's not because he's that intimidated by America, but America, when it's doing this, is representing the interests of London and Wall Street, mm. and they own... Tony Abbott is the biggest queen lover in the world, mm. and they own him lock, stock and barrel. He's proving that, mm. and he's very ideological about it. And unfortunately, Australia has missed out as a result of this. Mm. Now, it's very interesting, though, that even Paul Keating, former Prime Minister, who we really agree with, even he was able to recognise the shifting sands globally and made the point that the IMF and the World Bank days are over. This is the old transatlantic dominated world. Uh, and he said the world has changed and there will be a centre of gravity in the Pacific and East Asia. Yep. So, you know, you begin to see that even people like him are recognising there's a shift afoot. And from the words of, I want to mention a couple of um, comments from the Chinese and the Russians because they very explicitly want that to represent a change in the way the world functions, that it won't operate any longer from the standpoint of geopolitics and manipulation, but from the standpoint of nations working together for mutual benefit. So you had at the Schiller Institute conference that you were at, uh, Shi Zhu, the Director for International Energy Strategic Studies and the Senior Fellow of the China Institute of International Studies, and he said, look, the Chinese are going ab abiding by this principle of the three no's. Um, that is, no interference in the internal affairs of others, no seeking for spheres of influence, and no striving for hegemony. Likewise, you had the Russian President P Putin, Vladimir Putin, at the Valde Discussion Club in Sochi on the 24th of October, where he talked about how the end, at the end of the Cold War, a unipolar world was ushered in, and he said, this was simply a means of justifying dictatorship over people and countries. He said, national sovereignty was essentially put down and only the nations that uh, climbed the ladder by, quote, loyalty towards the world's sole power centre, unquote, could actually get ahead. So they explicitly are pushing to change that kind of world order um, to one that's based on equality and sovereignty, but we'll... And the two ideas are clashing. Mm, and we'll talk about it a bit more after this break. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where we're discussing the Australian government's decision not to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Now, this bank is devoted mainly to funding the building of the new Silk Road, which includes rail and other transportation corridors to link all of Eurasia, and the Maritime Silk Road, uh, which will ultimately benefit the entire world with those kind of trade routes opened up. 
And part of what's envisioned by the AIB explicitly are new port upgrades. Yep. And actually, there's a very interesting uh, part of that which uh, shows you there's different, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. The world is told we've got to have free trade. You know, all this wealth comes from free trade. Of course, the countries that get free trade like us, all we see is our industry is destroyed, right? Now, China's idea here and the countries are participating, they know that if instead of worrying about free trade agreements and slashing protective barriers and destroying industries and countries, if you focus on actually making the ports better mm. and the, the shipping channels better, therefore more efficient, that benefit to tra actual trade, physical trade, will far outseed anything that free trade concessions mm -hmm. can bring about. Mm -hmm. So co countries don't have to give up their sovereignty and their industries and whatever. They can actually trade better without that mm. if, if we go with this perspective. And it's, it just makes a lot of sense. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership... Is the opposite. In, in, yeah, contrasted to this, so the, it, won't well, help trade Well, of course, really. the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a US dictated thing with the 12 countries bordering the Pacific, except one, the biggest economy bordering the Pacific, China. And mm. that it's a bill of rights for multinational corporations. It's going to, it's going to, people might have probably heard about it. It's going to enshrine the corporate, multinational corporations above national laws so that if governments do things, that a corporation says, well, that's affected our profits, those corporations will be give, able to bring lawsuits against those governments. And um, Dr. Mahathir Mohammed last year warned that the biggest thing that's going to impact is government procurement. Mm. Because now governments would naturally, if they want to get, you know, governments are enormous buyers of supplies, right? They would tend to buy those supplies from their own domestic industries. There's a lot of money there mm -hmm. that, that helps those industries. This TPP is targeting that like a heat-seeking missile, so that gets knocked out, and governments will be forced to buy from these multinational corporations. Mm. And it's it, that's why we call it a free trade death pact, right? It doesn't yeah. benefit anybody at all. And the guy negotiating it on Australia's behalf, Elisa Andrew Robb, has been in the vanguard of the free trade annihilation for 30 years. He's one of the key ideologues that's pushed it from the get-go back when he was the head of the NFF. Mm. Um, all the way through the Liberal Party, etc. Mm. So this is a disaster that our government's choosing to participate in instead of the AIIB. Yeah, and our rejection of being a founding member of the AIIB is really rejecting our being a crucial part of this maritime Silk Road. Yeah, yeah. If you look at this map that we'll put up that was put together by Professor Lance Endersby, uh, who was a collaborator of ours, the late Professor Lance Endersby, I should say. Which I, which I showed in Germany at the conference I was at. Mm. And this shows, it's called his Asian Express, uh, that with the correct construction of ports with high-speed shipping, any part of Australia would be placed within just one to four days from any part of Asia, including the world's two largest ports in Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and so why would we reject the potential funding with no strings attached as opposed to the World Bank IMF apparatus when we have this vision for Australia to develop our country in play. Yeah, and that it's, it's just, it's just, it's imperial dictated suicide for us. Absolutely. So it's time for Australia to get on the bandwagon of the New World Economic Order. Uh, you can contact us to get a copy of the New Citizen that talks about the development projects that we've mapped out for Australia, which would fit in with the new Silk Road and the Maritime Silk Road, or call in to get a free copy of the Australian Alert Service with more information on all of the latest updates. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll hope to see you again next week for the CEC Report. Mm -hmm.